I love Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, Emeralds, and yes, even Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. While there are some problems that I have with them, mainly on the gameplay side of things, I find them all super enjoyable for reasons far removed from the classic draw of Pokemon. And if you know nearly anything about my relationship with the games, you'd also know that my adoration for these entries is primarily due to the region that they take place in. Hoenn. My philosophy for what makes a good region is summarized pretty well in my video on Sinnoh, which is linked in the description, so I'd recommend watching at least the introductory part of that if you're interested in what makes a great Pokemon setting for me. But while Sinnoh is what I consider to be the peak of the Pokemon games in terms of integrative, cohesive storytelling and efficiency through setting, Hoenn speaks to me in a different way, while not slacking on those elements either. I see it as the yin to Sinnoh's yang. While Sinnoh is quiet and poetic, Hoenn is bold, though it definitely has moments of respite when needed. Sinnoh is probably the coldest Pokemon region, and Hoenn is arguably the warmest. Sinnoh frequently looks back on the past, while Hoenn doesn't really concern itself much with times gone by, and instead looks upon the present, and at times, to the future. It is an ideal contrast to Sinnoh for me, while having a similar level of quality in terms of geographical flow, vastness, and thematic storytelling. Ever since I first played Pokemon Ruby as a 9 year old kid, I've been immersed and captivated by Hoenn for how vibrant and imaginative it is, and it has not left my list of favorite video game settings since. And as I've grown up and realized the surprising nuances that go into the narrative and setting design of some of the Pokemon games, I've only come to appreciate it more. Hoenn is, on the surface, hella awesome and unique. But there is a ton of thought put into it on a deeper level that connects with the other elements of the game, and that plays just as much of a part in why I find myself reflecting upon it again and again. Note that this video will be pointing out things about Hoenn from both the remakes and the original games. There will be more focus on the remakes due to them fleshing out the setting more visually, but I will refer to both versions throughout the video and point out some differences. Also, this video will not refer to the Delta episode from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire much, if at all, and will instead focus on the region and the main story of the game prior to the player beating the Elite Four. Regarding origin, Hoenn is inspired by the Japanese island of Kyushu, which is a very warm place in terms of climate, home to many hot springs and to Japan's most active volcano, Mount Aso. And due in part to this inspiration, Hoenn is the hottest, most exotic, and creative region in the series by my estimation, even while taking the comparable Alola into account. In terms of environment, it's characterized by tons of greenery and water throughout, but there is a lot of variety as well. There naturally are not any snowy mountaintops like in Johto, Sinnoh, Alola, or Galar, but there's basically everything else. A volcano, hot springs, a city in a meteor crater, a village built from driftwood, a town in the trees, a desert, beaches. Hoenn is brimming with not only a huge amount of variety and creativity, but with a sense of oneness with nature. Nature meaning both the environment and Pokemon, of course. Just a fleeting glance at the types of areas in this region gives an impression of these inhabitants doing their utmost to not disrupt the environment, and at the same time, to live in harmony with it. Hoenn was also the region to introduce the idea of different types of weather, which is appropriate given the sheer amount of different ideas we see packed into this tropical region. Much like Sinnoh, the different towns and areas feel very natural geographically, with a stable climate, some very believable topographical transitions between routes, and most importantly, with little to no inconsistency. And this maintains a genuine believability with the setting, which is a must for me. It is the region most connected with nature and as an extension, the region that is most in tune with Pokemon, with more people in cohabitants with the creatures than in any other main series game for me. And speaking of which, as words that are uttered and referred to consistently throughout the game by NPCs, balance and harmony are the main keys here. Defined as the quality of forming a pleasing and consistent whole, in the context of these games, it simply means living in balance with nature, others, and with Pokemon to enrich each other's lives. 
It's a synchronicity of sorts. Not too much of one thing or another, no huge emphasis on nature taking over, of Pokemon overpowering humans, or vice versa. In Hoenn's style of life, every aspect is important, but none are more important than the others. It's a similar sort of overall theme to the one I mentioned in my Sinnoh analysis, because both regions are concerned with connection, but Sinnoh diverges and explores connections to each other, history, and the concept of gratitude, whereas Hoenn uses connection as a platform to explore holistic balance in life and a respect for nature. And to clarify, it's not as if some other regions don't have this respect for nature as well, but it's made bolder in Hoenn due to the thematic focus of the story and due to the sheer unmatched quality and quantity of this sort of idea. A lot of people like to meme on the fact that Hoenn has too much water, but in this case, the region reflects this theme. Being roughly half land and half sea, representing the duality of Kyogre and Groudon and this theme of balance once more, with both land and water coalescing. So combining this half land, half water concept with the weather gives you an idea of what Hoenn is like overall. It isn't adverse to large cities and industry, but it is very much a region at one with the natural wonders, where so many of the settlements have been formed without disrupting the environment, while safely using nature for economic and lifestyle reasons. Overall, the vast majority of towns are largely dependent on and in tune with nature and Pokemon, and this idea is present not only within the individual towns, but through both the storyline of the game and through the region as a whole. The first two towns of Little Root and Old Dale are not overly special, and are more or less what one would expect from what are essentially a couple of tutorial areas. They're quaint, small, and quiet, and the NPCs tend to stick to giving out gameplay tips rather than giving world building details. However, I do think that there's something significant about them if you look at the tiny details, particularly in the remakes. You'll notice that Little Root specifically has very dark, natural forest thickets surrounding it in a way that is unique in the region. And this may seem pretentious, but I think it's important. As I said, they're very similar to the stereotypical starting areas in Pokemon, but these two towns, particularly Little Root due to being more remote, connect a little bit more thematically in this way right off the bat. There is immediately a sense that these tiny bergs are nestled deep in a forest, perhaps a forest clearing, in areas overridden by greenery. If you look at the overview pictures of the towns, they look incredibly isolated and segregated, like detached forest settlements, even if neither are overly far from the next town over. And this gives the impression of settlements that quietly built themselves wherever it was possible, and without harming nature, in order to just live life as they could. Or at least, that's the impression that I get from it. Little Root's motto is, a town that cannot be shaded by any hue, and this speaks of its unchanging, maintained outlook. Add this sort of element to the man who blocks you from progressing early on in order to draw a sketch of what he thought were Pokemon footprints, and these two towns subtly yet substantially express a clear desire to be one with the natural order and to preserve it, which is a clever introduction to the overall theme of harmony with nature. Also, Professor Birch is not in his lab at the very beginning of the game because he prefers to do field work instead of staying indoors, which is also indicative of this region's themes. Moving west, Petalburg City is known as the place where people mingle with nature, which could be the slogan for the region overall, and it's an interesting transitional area. It's still very forested and kinda isolated, but it does broaden the world a bit. Although it's initially inaccessible, you're introduced to the first gym run by your dad, and to Wally, who ends up being your rival. It's a town with roughly double the number of inhabitants compared to the first two, so it gradually introduces the society and setting a bit more. But it also opens up visually in a subtle little way, as this is the first town that has those light brown dirt paths. It brightens up the palette a tad, and gives the impression that we're slowly leaving the isolated forest areas towards the more populated hubs of the region. An interesting thing to note is that Wally leaves Petalburg early on in the story due to his frailty and poor health, in order to live in an area with cleaner air, according to his family. Personally, I'm not exactly sure what is unclean about Petalburg, 
Although, the map states that there is always a whiff of salt in the air due to the nearby ocean, so my guess is that moving deeper inland was best for the purest atmosphere and environment possible. Moving northwest from Petalburg, we reach Route 104, where we finally shift from the consistent greenery to a cottage, a sandy beach, and the ocean for the first time, a hint of what was to come. This opening up of the world is almost immediately closed off, however, upon entering Petalburg Woods. While I do like the effect of the sun peeking through the trees and the grass swaying slightly in the wind, I'm not a huge fan of this place in terms of atmosphere and much prefer the wonderful Eterna Forest from Sinnoh, but it does the job as a creepy little den and it introduces the Slackoth and Shroomish lines, both of which are Pokemon that fit incredibly well with a warm forest habitat in terms of their design. Past these woods, beyond the flower shop, and through a fishing area of sorts, we come to Rustboro City, the third largest city in the game and the proper introduction to the vastness of Hoenn as the world finally opens up to the player, even though it's still somewhat tucked into the corner of the region and on the outskirts of the mainland. And while it may seem that an industrial hub like this, especially one that is stated to have been created as a result of the cutter clearing a sizable portion of forest, would starkly contrast the slowly building theme of harmony that I described, it is far from inconsistent. Rustboro's slogan is a city probing the integration of nature and science, which is a nod to that sense of balance again. Rustboro is a city that revolves around stones. The buildings are said to have been crafted from stones, the gym is a rock type challenge, and the Devon Corporation, a technological tycoon that develops items for trainers, also doubles as a company that revives Pokemon fossils. So it does indeed interact with nature, it just happens to be with stones and the earth rather than plants or water. And it maintains a connection with Pokemon through resurrecting them from fossils and through teaching about them through the Pokemon Trainer School. A notable aspect to this area is Route 116 to the east, a grassy route leading to the blocked Rusturf Tunnel. With the entire heart of Hoenn accessible through the tunnel, a collection of workers decided to start digging through it. However, the entire project was stopped once they realized that it was disturbing and hurting the Pokemon that inhabited the area. Clearing the tunnel would have been hugely significant for the transport of goods, travel, and ease of access throughout the region. As the player experiences, it is very inconvenient, but regardless, the lives and well-being of Pokemon are of utmost importance, and so they outweigh the significance of the task, which halts the digging and leaves Rustturf Tunnel blocked. It's yet another example of this theme of harmony with nature, and we've barely gotten started yet. After conquering Rustboro, the player is forced to travel by sea, thanks to Mr. Briny, to Duford Town a small island community in the southwest corner of the map that doubles as a stopping point for transport between Slateport and Route 104. I adore the atmosphere here. Despite having a pretty exuberant gym, the town isn't overly loud or bustling. It's just an understated little settlement, minding their own business and living at peace with the sea. The music is a favorite of mine too, incredibly mellow and easygoing, so much so that you can almost hear the crashing waves. An endearing aspect of this place is the Duford Town Hall, where residents are so obsessed with being up to date with trends that they latch on to new phrases in the hopes of being trendy, and anything the player tells them catches on like wildfire. It's cute and charming, and adds a nice little dimension of community to a town that doesn't have much otherwise apart from atmosphere. And to the north is Granite Cave, shown to be a place where rock collectors, and notably champion Steven, go to find stones, so this is a connection to the main theme once more. Overall, Duford is a continuation of the aforementioned Unity, and it's a lovely little intermission sandwiched in between two large and bustling cities, which adds a nice bit of balance and flow to the adventure. The next stop on the journey has the player traveling northeast across a large expanse of sea, past Sea Mauville, which I'll talk about later, and past little blots of sandy land until Mr. Briny stops at the dock on Route 109. The player is immediately met by a huge number of Pokemon trainers raring to fight. This is very clearly a leveling spot primarily, but the sheer amount of little bits of charm introduce the player to the grand world of Hoenn that they're about to step into. With people swimming and in bathing suits all over the place, this beach introduces this part of Hoenn as a bustling tourist spot of sorts, full of places to see and things to do. 
The seashore house, the kids making sandcastles, the many umbrellas and beach chairs, the amount of people taking in all that nature has to offer, it really helps to immerse and present the themes bluntly for the first time in the game, in preparation for one of the largest cities. Slateport is one of my favorite Pokemon port towns, one whose economy thrives through the selling and transportation of goods via the market and the shipyard respectively. While one might assume that such a commercial giant of a city came to be through artificial means, Slateport is stated to have grown from humble beginnings in an organic way. As an offshoot of land blessed with pure, clean water, food and harvest were plentiful, which caused a tiny market to sprout and naturally grow into the shopping attraction that it is in the game. Due to this thriving economy, the city also developed itself into a port that allowed ships in and out for travel and transport, and the lighthouse was built as a result. As an aside, there's an edgy sailor by that very lighthouse who ponders whether the sea could have been formed by the tears of Pokemon, which is a bit overdramatic, but it sets a tone. There are other attractions too. This is the first place with a Pokemon contest hall. Slateport is also the home of Captain Stern, a celebrity sea explorer of sorts, and linked to that, it also has an oceanic museum that attracts nearly as many tourists as the market. Thanks to the music, which is a slower and melancholic remix of the SS Anne theme from the Kanto games, Hoenn takes advantage of some nostalgia here. The Oceanic Museum is a location where people gather and share appreciation for nature's wonders, which is significant and fitting for obvious reasons, but this museum stands out for the way it evokes memories of past experiences. I did say earlier that Hoenn doesn't look to the past much, but this is one of the exceptions. And as a location that reflects on times gone by, it's a cool little bit of foreshadowing and a hint as to what the next region, Sinnoh, would focus on thematically. Aside from that, Slateport's music has always reminded me of Christmas time, which, intentional or otherwise, is a nice touch in a region otherwise bereft of any winter touches. All in all, it's not only a super fun town to explore, but it is a deceivingly amazing representation of the themes of Hoenn as a whole. A place that thrives thanks to the blessings of nature, that coexists as equals with Pokemon, that makes its name garnering appreciation for the world's natural wonders, and one that has some slight nostalgic tinges that tug at the heartstrings as well. But traveling north from Slateport brings us to yet another awesome example of thematic storytelling through geography and visuals, Route 110. In a stretch that connects Slateport to the more northern areas, this is Hoenn's version of Cycling Road, with one grassy path below and the paved biking path above. And while it isn't anything special in a vacuum, the design of this route is actually pretty profound contextually. I'm not kidding. You can laugh at this if you want, but this specific cycling road in this context is incredibly telling with regards to the theme of the game. There are two specific bits of dialogue that sum it up well. First is the map's explanation of the route, which describes the grassy road as a time-worn path where nature remains untouched. And second is a bit of NPC dialogue from an elderly man at the north end of the route, where he says, The two roads, one above, one below. A road each for people and Pokemon. Perhaps that is right and fair. Two roads. It's not a division between people and Pokemon, it's cooperation, and an acknowledgement and respect of the differences between them. Clearly in the past, humans wanted a cycling road for ease of travel and convenience sake, especially given the amount of goods that would be coming out of Slateport. And as such, they could have demolished the natural land in favor of a paved road, thus destroying a natural Pokemon habitat. But instead, they built a cycling road above it to allow them to live in peace. Note that the map description is sure to say that the nature path is completely untouched. It's a show of respect from Hoenn's inhabitants for both nature and Pokemon. That while they do live together in the many different towns, in certain ways, they each have different needs. And those needs will be considered in a balance of civilization and nature. Aside from that, it's worth noting that the Trick House is here, which is a consistently fun place to go in between gym challenges. And that the path going west from here, Route 103, leads to Oldale Town as long as the player has Surf, which is a nice bit of connectivity within the region. Additionally, on this route is the power plant of sorts entitled New Mauville, which was originally meant to become an underground city, but was scrapped in development. 
However, it was discovered that the plant had become a habitat for all sorts of electric Pokemon, so the place remained untouched as well out of respect for them, which fits in seamlessly with the thematic significance of this route. Next up is Mauville City, the most central hub in the region connecting the north, south, east, and west of Hoenn, and one of the biggest differences between the remakes and the originals. In Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Mauville is a moderately sized city, with a bike shop, the third gym, and a game corner. Yet despite being an important city, I find it kind of unimpressive. Even the music is the reused Rustboro theme. In the remakes, however, it is completely unrecognizable, and it is the most populated city in the game. The game corner has been closed down, the city has completely expanded, and the majority of it is indoor, becoming something of a mix between a city and a gigantic shopping mall. As the story goes in Emerald, the gym leader, Watson, had plans to completely renovate the city, but they never came to fruition. Yet in the remakes, he succeeded in his plan and based the place off of Lumio City from Kalos. It's described by the map as a crossroads between the past and a bright future, which is a subtle nod to the progressive nature of Hoenn, that it looks to the future as well and not just the present. Regardless, from the bike store to the food court to the various little shops and restaurants, Mauville is absolutely full of things to do, and is once again an example of industry and technological advancement in Hoenn, but not at the expense of nature. To the west of Mauville, past a short yet pleasant route full of trainers exercising, Kempt Lawns, Blue Ponds, and Hoenn's Daycare Center, is Verdanturf Town. Among some other things, it's once again a demonstration of the connectivity between regions in Hoenn, as the player can unblock Rust Turf Tunnel if they have Rock Smash, connecting Rustboro to Verdanturf. The slogan here is among my favorite ever, the windswept highlands with the sweet fragrance of grass. It's evocative and soothing just reading that, and it's a great descriptor of the town. Verdanturf is a quiet little village, in a location surrounded by grassy plains and mountains, where the wind blows in such a specific way that ensures that the town never comes into contact with any volcanic ash that tends to impact the other nearby areas. In fact, this prime location and these wind conditions make air impurity an impossibility, so Verdanturf is considered the cleanest and healthiest place to live, which is why Wally moved here. Characteristically, it isn't very significant or notable, but it's again a consistent example of people living at peace and balance with the world, and I find it to be a lovely spot to relax and listen to the calming music to mellow out a little bit, especially after Slateport and Mauville. Now, if we move north from Mauville, we begin at Route 111 and approach the parts of the region where Hoenn really begins to strut its stuff geographically. This is the mountainous section of Hoenn, but in sharp contrast to the snowy and cold mountains of some of the other games, this was Pokemon's first foray into presenting a desert, one that is sandwiched in between the northern and southern parts of Route 111. And I'd say it does pretty well. The greenery and water believably transition into dirt paths, helped thanks to the entire area being surrounded by red mountains. And the desert itself, which is initially inaccessible, does its job at adding a unique exotic flavor to the region and housing a legendary, as explorers constantly try to unearth the secrets within the sand. West to the entrance of the desert is Route 112, which leads the player to Mount Chimney's base. From here, one can traverse the Fiery Path, which is a sweltering hot tunnel that runs underneath Mount Chimney, or they can ride the cable car, which takes passengers up to the peak of the volcano. And this is Hoenn's take on Mount Asso, a primal form of natural expression. But importantly, this entire mountain and volcano are totally undisturbed and untouched, with the exception of the cable car system. This volcano is left as is, and it's appropriate that a game that embraces the concept of harmony with nature would contain such a harsh form of it. Despite this, however, trainers battle at the top of Mount Chimney to improve, living side by side with the elements. And the story events here make this message even bolder. During this mid-game story section, Team Magma or Team Aqua intend to use a meteorite in order to alter the natural state of Mount Chimney and make it either active or dormant respectively. However, the player defeats them and thwarts their plan, not allowing them to disrupt nature's balance. After this, and beneath the jagged pass, is the therapeutic Lava Ridge Town, which sits right at the base of the volcano. 
While the gym leader, Flannery, has a bolsterous and fiery personality, the town itself is incredibly mellow. Due to being situated at the foot of Mount Chimney, it is blessed with a natural hot spring accessible through the Pokemon Center. And while it is small, thanks to the natural healing elements of the spring and of the hot sand that surrounds it, it's a desirable spot for elderly people to visit. And all of these elements, plus the soothing music, makes it a really lovely location. It's a nice bit of integration and logic. It's a bit of a no-brainer that a small village like this would crop up in this location to take advantage of these springs, people are resourceful after all, and to coexist with the world in its natural state and use it to live. Now, if the player takes the fiery path north instead of the cable car, they can reach the upper part of Route 111, just past the desert. Along with containing a nice little rest stop maintained by an old woman, this is the place where secret bases are first introduced. By teaching a Pokemon secret power, a TM obtainable here, players can simply make an opening in certain places. In a shrub, up a tree, in a rocky wall, and within these, they can find a sizable room of sorts for them to call home and accessorize. I found this to be pretty awesome and fun when first playing these games as a kid. The idea of a secret base is just eternally cool in the mind of a child, especially one that is personalized and totally you. So mixing that concept and putting it in a Pokemon game just has an inherent draw to it, especially for children. And it's once again an example of not disrupting, but living in unity with the environment. Heading west, we enter Route 113, which is personally one of my favorite Pokemon locations due to the way it seems to be a wondrous, awe-inspiring route set in a place of its own, yet at the same time consistent with the context of the region. This is a route not nearly as bright and green as the ones before it, a place where the volcanic ash cast off from Mount Chimney falls and blankets the ground like snow. And due to this falling ash, the darker aesthetic, and the somber, eerily beautiful music, Route 113 is contemplative and incredibly atmospheric. It's a place of serious reflection and appreciation for this natural wonder, and it contrasts the vibrancy of the region with this quiet and profound nature. The likes of Mount Chimney, the Fiery Path, the Desert Ruins, Route 111, 112, and 113 are all this setting at its purest. Rough terrain, stormy deserts, volcanoes, ash falling onto adjacent areas, this is the wonder of nature, and as harsh as it may be, in Hoenn it is untainted and appreciated by people. No one here quakes, they battle atop the mountain, they strap on some goggles and explore the desert, they scale the mountains. Nature is there to be celebrated, and Hoenn inhabitants know this more than anyone else. Now, on Route 113 is a house known as the Glass Workshop, where volcanic ash that is collected by the player as they traverse can be made into certain items. It's a neat little display of taking advantage of this sort of thing, as the services and economics of the area revolve around what's available. And this aspect continues into town directly west. In places like Lava Ridge and Slateport, we've seen a common theme in Hoenn settlements using the natural, local characteristics of the immediate area and optimizing them to live, and Fall Arbor is no different. As a tiny farming town nestled in the shadow of Mount Chimney, the residents live simple but worthwhile lives using what they have. The everyday life here revolves around the crops of the local farmland, but due to the environment, it isn't an easy place to make this sort of living. However, that doesn't deter Fall Arbor, and the citizens instead focus on planting specific, tough and hardy crops that grow even in the presence of ash and the relatively infertile ground. It's a modest little community that isn't afraid to adapt when required to, and it's a peaceful little pit stop on the way to Meteor Falls. It is also noted by the map and plot that this is a great place for scholars to gather to research meteorites, as this part of the region has come into contact with them before. Professor Cosmos lives here, and he is the foremost example of this, with his house living next to a sizable crater. So while Hoenn is very much concerned with the natural world, it also takes time to focus on the foreign mysteries that we may not be aware of, and this continues later in the game, in both the short term and the long term. Spanning south and west from Fall Arbor's fields is Route 114, which is a rough path en route to Meteor Falls full of campers, fishers, researchers, and hikers. 
The fossil maniac resides here, tunneling through a man-made cave over time, as does Lynette, who created the PC system and continuously conducts research. Upon entering Meteor Falls, it is immediately clear that this place is touched by something not of this area. It's oddly mystical and totally stands out in terms of color palette, full of waterfalls and bright, yellowish rock throughout. It is said that this place was the site of a meteor shower, and was once inhabited by an ancient people, and it's pretty easy to believe that given how much it stands out in aesthetics and atmosphere. Researchers investigate these grounds very often, observing the stones and cave, and overall I think Meteor Falls adds a lovely little bit of otherworldly mystery and intrigue to a region that has otherwise been pretty grounded up until now. At this point, the entirety of Western Hoenn has been explored by the player, and they are now able to return to Petalburg and defeat their father for the fifth gym badge, getting the ability to surf along the way. And this opens up the eastern half of Hoenn, to the right of Mauville, which has an entirely different complexion to the areas we've explored thus far, without being out of place or jarring. In contrast to the rough, scorching nature of the previous areas, Route 119 is something much different in both atmosphere and design. As the first route to feature rain, not just in Hoenn but in the entire series, this place is another display of nature at its purest, but in the context of a much lusher, much wetter rainforest environment. With the constant storm, the long grass, the flowing river, and the exposure to new Pokemon like Tropius, whose designs totally integrate with the environment, this area is a ton of fun to traverse, despite being a long trek. And while I do love the desert, mountain, and volcano areas, this is a super refreshing tropical direction for the region to flow into, in terms of both in-game weather and the blue-green color palette. Route 119 also contains the Weather Institute, where researchers observe the weather in hopes of using these patterns to better understand the world. Moving on from this route, we reach one of the damn coolest Pokemon locations ever. Renowned as the treetop city that frolics with nature, perhaps the boldest display of Hoenn's main ideas, the gorgeous Fortree City. This was the ultimate area of escapism for me as a child. A town full of houses built on top of trees, with ladders and wooden bridges in between for travel. A town full of tree houses in a rainforest. It's just awesome, and I don't need to explain why this is probably the most telling indicator of the people of Hoenn living in unity with nature and Pokemon. By preserving the natural environment of Fortree, and by living literally within that environment, they are able to come in contact with more wild Pokemon than anywhere else in the region. Bugs fly in the houses in the middle of the night, wild Kecleon are common, and Pokemon are seen throughout the city. In addition, the citizens are very fit due to the active lifestyle required to live here, and the vast majority express a joy at being able to live this closely with Pokemon. There's just a palpable sense of harmony and appreciation throughout. The music is laid back yet not lethargic, incorporating a sense of peace and organic atmosphere to the already wonderful concepts. And the place continuously thrives, as the bountiful amount of rain in the area keeps the trees growing strong and healthy. It's a super memorable city, and one of the shining spots of Hoenn. To the east of Fortree, Route 120 is just as huge as 119, with many of the same elements. The rainfall, the bodies of water, the grass and trees. Though for me it isn't too too notable apart from a sealed off little cavern that houses Registeel. The adjacent Route 121 is not much to speak of either except for the attached Safari Zone and the entrance to Route 122, but the map entry for Route 122, which leads to the Hoenn region's version of a cemetery, is pretty meaningful. It states that people make their way to Mount Pyre over this water route, reliving many precious memories as they traverse it. And while Mount Pyre doesn't connect as deeply with the themes of these games as much as the Lost Tower does with Platinum, the imagery of trainers reflecting on their past memories with their departed friends is really quite something. Just them, their surfing Pokemon, the swaying breeze and the water. One with nature, Pokemon, and their sweet memories. It is also worth noting that living on top of Mount Pyre is an old couple who guard the red and blue orbs, the relics capable of awaking Groudon and Kyogre. So while this location doesn't have much cohesion thematically, the fact that these orbs, which represent the essence of Hoenn's lore, reside on it just gives the feeling that it all ties together rather nicely. 
Continuing even further east, the player reaches the coastal town of Lily Cove, an extremely bustling and excitable tourist destination and a place of residence for many. The Lily Cove Museum in the northwest corner of the city is of significance due to presenting this connection to Pokemon once again, featuring all manner of statues and paintings depicting them. In contrast to Slateport's Oceanic Museum, which helped people witness natural wonders firsthand, the Lily Cove Museum houses art of Pokemon that helps foster a greater appreciation for them. Aside from this, Lily Cove is home to the department store, which attracts all manner of customers, another contest hall slash battle tent, the Cove Lily Motel, where tourists make their stay and spend their downtime, and the Lily Cove Harbor, similar to Slateport's shipyard and the hub for transport and trade. Due to all of these attractions, Lily Cove is one of the most active and populated cities in the region, but what I take away from it is something a bit more abstract. Stating the obvious, it is the city on the eastern coast of the Hoenn mainland. Its slogan is, where the land ends and the sea begins. Not only is it atmospheric and soothing to relax here, and not only is it a town full of culture and celebration, but it is the point where the half of the region that is land and the half that is water connect with each other. While other towns such as Slateport and Duford had this sea connection as well, Lilico feels different due to being the last city on the mainland before the player's exploration of the story starts them on a journey through Hoenn's ocean, so in this sense, it is the true gateway. This is the spot of synthesis for the entire region, the crux of Hoenn's geographical balance. Admittedly, the music here is a highlight too, and a big reason as to why the lasting impression of Lily Cove to me is not one of huge excitement, but of respite and calm, reflecting this soulful message. As we begin our trek through the infamous Too Much Water portion of the region, I think it's important to acknowledge that, yes, surfing through this area can be monotonous and tedious. I don't personally have much of a problem with it, but I can appreciate that others do. Yet, thematically it makes total sense that there is nearly as much water as there is land, a cohabitance between two very different aspects of nature that tie into that ever-present theme of balance and harmony. A cohabitance, I might add, that Team Magma or Aqua is trying to break apart, making them the antithesis to this story. And on a related note, ditto with the diving segments, which can be slow in practice, yet are appropriate for this specific game as a representation of exploring the unknowns of the natural world. The next stop is Moss Deep City, Stephen's home and an island city full of wholesome appreciation for the world. Moss Deep is covered in plants and flowers, unique wildlife different from any other city in Hoenn, likely due to being the only city that is a natural island landmass that contains fertile soil, although admittedly that could just be headcanon. A common Moss Deep tradition is whalemer watching, where the inhabitants gather on the shore to observe the Pokemon and celebrate this phenomenon. But aside from the naturalistic elements, Moss Deep has a bit of a unique side to it in that like Meteor Falls and Fall Arbor, it too is deeply focused on astronomy. Due to the local area having clear weather most of the time, it was decided that this was a good place for a space station to test out rocket launches and probe the unknowns of the universe. And there is quite a sense of identity and pride that is formed around this by the people of the city. There's a white rock near the center of town meant to be a good luck charm of sorts, to bless fortune upon the rockets that the space station sends out. There are people who watch the launches, who revolve their lives around keeping up with the progress of the research. It's similar to the region encompassing idea of living with nature, but applied to the outer reaches of the universe. Add all this to their slogan, which is Cherish Pokemon, and Moss Deep proves to be one of the richest towns, with a deeply entrenched culture, fixated on gaining knowledge from the space station that has become its trademark, and on living out a simple life at sea with Pokemon. Although I am disappointed that it didn't have any exclusive music, it is undoubtedly full of character and substance, and it's a nice little detail that the gym leaders use Solrock and Lunatone to reflect the culture of the city. To the north of Moss Deep is Shoal Cave, an icy cavern home to some exclusive Pokemon and useful items. I don't have much to say about it, but I do like that it has a natural explanation for its origin. The cave was formed as the ocean continuously pounded on a large expanse of rock, and this roughness and unpredictability of the sea is such a constant factor even now that the cave can experience high and low tide inside, granting the player access to different areas at different times of the day. 
As far as I know, there is no huge meaning to this, but I'm a sucker for these little tiny bits of world building to add flavor to the region, and Shoal Cave is yet another example of this in Hoenn. Home to the 8th and final gym, and only accessible from above using fly or from below using dive, Sutopolis is one of the most scenic and striking locations in the entirety of Pokemon. As a city located inside a huge, white crater, with architecture and a layout reminiscent of Greece, it is an encapsulation of the bold and unique style of Hoenn and its approach to the geography, topography, and towns. The history and origin of the city, however, varies depending on which of the games is being played. In Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Sutopolis formed as a result of an eruption from an underwater volcano that rose to the surface and filled with rainwater. In the remakes, the crater was created due to the impact of a large meteorite that crashed into the Hoenn region and filled with rainwater as well. The clear, warm climate and the fresh water attracted people to the area, and eventually, a city was formed. Regardless of the origin, there is a neat little thematic tie-in, with Sutopolis being formed as a result of a wonder of nature that people were drawn to, gathered within, and were able to form a life around. The many buildings are accessible at different altitudes, and require crossing the water or climbing many stairs, so the people are fit as well, making this a lively city, which is accentuated by the energetic and exotic sounding music. But aside from this, Sutopolis also houses the Cave of Origin, which is the reason that the city's slogan refers to history slumbering here. It is said that the Cave of Origin is where life began. And this makes sense, since it is a sacred place where the player can encounter Groudon or Kyogre, insinuating that these Pokémon, the representations of the two elements that make up Hoenn, were the root of it all, the reason that land and water came to be in this region. An idea that is only substantiated further when you look into the lore, which I'll go over in a bit. Only people of great importance are allowed to enter the Cave of Origin, yet regardless, everyone has a good sense of the significance of this place, and it adds depth and a mystical, historical nature to the lore of Hoenn that is only expanded upon in the rest of the late game areas. If you'll allow me to skip forward a little geographically, we can circle back to the abandoned ship, or Sea Mauville in the remakes. Located in between Duford and Slateport, the abandoned ship is the remains of a wreckage of a boat that was lodged onto the rocks, while Sea Mauville was a research facility commissioned by Mauville and led by a number of notable researchers. The goal of Sea Mauville was to discover and extract natural resources from this part of the sea. The facility was closed and planned to be demolished, but it was discovered that, just like with New Mauville, many types of Pokémon had begun inhabiting this place. So in order to preserve this, the demolition was cancelled and Sea Mauville became what it became. In both cases, it's an example of Pokémon learning to live with the remains of something man-made. Mankind's creation became a natural aspect of the environment, just as much of a part of Hoenn as the trees and caves and sea and desert. It's really quite a beautiful concept. People, Pokémon, everyone is part of the natural cycle, and these types of aspects of the region prove that living in unity and sharing what we have is 100% feasible. Both of these locations are somber and sad in a sense. In the original games, the wreckage evokes thoughts of a potential tragedy and the lives that could have been lost here. And in the remakes, it's just kind of melancholic to look upon this facility that once had so much ambition and purpose, and is now left as a decrepit, empty building full of old memories. I see this as a sort of preview of the Sinnoh theme of reflecting on the past, while also being a relic that is explored and used by trainers and wild Pokémon alike. It is a merger between the themes of Hoenn, a harmony between people, Pokémon, and nature, and that of Sinnoh, of connections to the past, of never forgetting our roots. And as a result, I see the abandoned ship and Sea Mauville as a sort of thematic bridge from Hoenn going into Sinnoh. Now, the last proper town in the game is one of my personal favorites, for once again being incredibly unique and cohesive, standing out on its own as an awesome idea while being consistent with the environment and themes of Hoenn. The appeal of Pacific Log is very similar to that of Fortry for me, being a prime encapsulation of Hoenn's concepts and focus in town form. It's simply a settlement of people doing what they can to live and thrive using nature, but not disturbing it. A floating village of houses built on lumber and wood, Pacific Log is said to reside on top of a colony of Corsola that live in the ocean. 
It is a custom in Pacific Log to swim in adjacent routes in the mornings, and to regularly fish to make a living, so just as in Fortry and Sutopolis, people tend to be very healthy here. Yet aside from this aspect of the village, it diverges from Fortry's style in that it has quite a focus on mystique, in terms of nature and Pokemon legend. The originators of Pacific Log were said to have spent the entirety of their lives on boats, searching for something. And this notion of the endless search is the essence of the town. The people here are very much fixated on myths, lore, and the mysteries of the world. Folks speak of a legend of a flying dragon Pokemon that lives near the town, and it is the ambition of many to catch a glimpse of it. Conversations often revisit the topic of the sealed away legendary Titan trio, and people are totally enraptured by the mirage locations that crop up every once in a while, natural wonders that were spoken of in the past and are still a topic of interest in the present. Due to this culture and the focus on myth and legend, Pacific Log, Sea Mauville, and the Oceanic Museum are the rare locations in Hoenn that I reckon fixate on the past. As I said, it isn't as if this region never dwells on times gone by, it's just incredibly rare, and people are much more concerned with living in the here and now than looking back. Very last on our list is the self-proclaimed city that isn't really much of a city at all, Evergrande. It's basically just an entry to Victory Road, and eventually to the Pokemon League challenge, but the essence of this place in a region like Hoenn sort of speaks to me in a way. A remote island only accessible through scaling a waterfall, full of bloom and greenery, the slogan is that this place is a paradise of flowers, the sea, and Pokemon, and combining that with the implications of Evergrande being an evergreen city digs into something pretty meaningful. The idea that Hoenn will never lose track of its roots, that it will always be at one with nature, the trees, the water, the harsh elements that it will always tout the importance of Pokemon, and that the inhabitants will never forget about this sacred bond tying it all together, this sense of harmony. Hoenn is a very special region. It has a very clear thematic focus and it tackles it consistently, without ever being too blunt due to the pure imagination put into it. And Evergrande, through this succinct, quiet message, is a bittersweet farewell to the region. Now, the ideas that I talk about here are not just presented through the locations we traverse and through what they communicate, but also through how these locations form a primary part of a cohesive whole and integrate with the other elements of the game. For me, the strongest Pokemon games are the ones that are able to merge the themes of the plot and lore with the ones that are constantly portrayed in the areas that the player travels through. And the Hoenn entries do this beautifully, as both the story events of the game and the details behind some of the legendary Pokemon help to drive these messages home and prop Hoenn up as a truly profound video game setting. The best place to start would be in tackling the origin of the Hoenn region and how it was created according to legend. This legend focuses primarily on the trio of Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza, and while the likes of the Reggie trio, Jirachi, and Deoxys are still meaningful, I just personally believe that the aforementioned three fit most effectively for this video, and as such, I'll only be focusing on their roles. As explained by in-game lore introduced in Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby, Hoenn was created after the birth of Primal Groudon and Primal Kyogre. It is said that Primal Groudon formed the land masses that make up the structural skeleton of the region, and that Primal Kyogre used its power to create all of the bodies of water. Together, the two formed Hoenn, and the combination of their specialties is what allows plant life to thrive in the land. There are naturally some places where Groudon's influence is greater, such as in the northwestern portion of the map around Mount Chimney, and there are places where Kyogre reigns supreme, like in the sea, but overall, the importance of the two legendaries is balanced out, and Hoenn is only able to exist and flourish due to the cooperation between the power of the two. However, it is said that upon coming into contact, the two engaged in a fierce battle for dominance to have their power wipe out the others. As such, Rayquaza, the mythical dragon Pokemon spoken of stories in Old in Pacific Log, descended and ended the clash between them. 
It sent Groudon and Kyogre into separate caverns, and put them into a deep sleep to ensure that balance in the land would always be maintained, as long as their sleep would never be interrupted. And here is where the goals of the antagonistic team of the game come into play, that of either Team Magma or Team Aqua, depending on the version being played. I've alluded to it before, but the goal of Team Magma and Aqua is to create a world of either sunlight or water respectively, to drive out the presence of the other and expand the presence of what they favor. They believe that their desired world would be ideal for both Pokemon and humans, and this causes them to want to awake either Groudon or Kyogre to achieve that goal, which leads to the player counteracting them. Ultimately, they are unsuccessful, and the player is able to ensure that neither land nor water overtakes the other and throws the region out of whack, because, as we know by now, Hoenn requires balance in all aspects of life to continue to prosper, and in this context, a harmony and cohabitance between land and water. However, this is only the case in the original games. In the remakes, the goals of both teams are quite different. They still involve the dominance of either land or water in this proposed new world, but only as a byproduct of their true aims. Instead, Team Magma's ideals are centered on human progress. They believe that the concept of coexistence is futile and foolish, and that the way forward is for humans to get a role of increased importance and continue to develop technology and build new and improved civilizations on the increased amount of land at the expense of Pokemon. Whereas on the other hand, Team Aqua believes that human civilization is a mistake and should be completely wiped out, and so they plan to achieve this by expanding the sea and destroying every last trace of humanity, bringing the region to a state of pure ocean, the origin of the world. And from here, they propose that Pokemon can live in peace and prosperity without human interference. This is the crux of the conflict. Human Domination versus Pokemon Domination. And after the player quells the legendary Pokemon, defeats the teams, and proves them incorrect, they realize their mistakes and express their remorse at how wrong they were to enact their will on an already thriving world, thereby throwing it out of balance in a harmful way themselves. They then resolve to promote their passions in a much more cooperative way instead of disbanding like they do in the original games, working together to promote a synthesis of land and sea and of Pokemon and humanity that benefits all. This drives the message home, and it's a strong reflection of the harmony that we see promoted through the game again and again in the region. The conclusion here is that too much of anything is detrimental to all, and that equilibrium within Hoenn and a cooperation of all the separate elements is the way forward. That Pokemon and people are bettered by each other's existence. These are not messages that are totally exclusive to the Hoenn entries, but these are the games that place this at the forefront of the plot, thematics, and setting, and present this with an unparalleled and sincere respect and authenticity. Hoenn is just a wonderful video game setting, totally engaging through the tiny details within the locations that build immersion, completely vibrant and creative through the sheer imagination put into its design, and emotionally resonant through how this theme of coexistence is approached time and time again. Many thanks for watching.